Good afternoon. As soon as my boss sits down, I can start. I'm, I'm never supposed to start until he is comfortable. There we go. Um, but I will tell you that he is really good at showing us all how to turn off our cell phones. There we go. He's got his own little shush thing going on. Um, I'm Lynn Snodgrass. I'm the CEO of the Best Darn Chamber in the Portland area, soon to be the Best Darn Chamber in the Pacific Northwest with Gresham. And I am thrilled that we have two amazing candidates with us today. It's no, um, it's, it's really difficult sometimes to gather interest to have high quality and statewide candidates come. And the fact that they came and made sure that they were here, they're here on time, um, they're ready to answer all of your questions, I'm just very pleased. But that also shows you how important you are. You as voters, but you as Gresham residents. We appreciate that. I will tell you, you will get to ask questions of these individuals, so please start jotting them down. The way it's going to go today, in a minute we're going to flip a coin. One of them is going to say heads or tails. No, neither one of them are going to say heads or tails, sorry. Flip a coin, I'll tell you how it's going to work. And then whoever wins gets to start with their opening speech and then also gets to start with a closing as well. Okay, so with that being said, I'm gonna start this the way I normally do and that's to give a great big thank you and round of applause to our presenting sponsors, Riverview Community Bank. Larry, where are you? Thank you very much. He's, he's recovering from too much golf and too many Advil yesterday. Notice I didn't tell them all of the story. We also want to thank Portland General Electric. John couldn't make it here today, but without Riverview and Portland General Electric, this event would not take place, so we do appreciate him. Our education sponsor is Gresham Barlow School District. We are very grateful to them as well. And our media sponsor, Keith Thomas, thank you very much. He is with Metro East Community Media. And we have flyers out on the table as you leave, um, out on the registration ta table, to let you know when the re, when the production, when the, what is it called? When the audio, when it comes out, when it's produced, when it's on the TV channel. Replay, that's the word. But, and I really messed that up because not only is Keith here, but his new boss is here. Marty, would you stand up please? There we go, Marty. We are gonna get to know him. <laughs> See, without a script, this is what it sounds like. I'm sorry, there you go. We do thank our media sponsor, Metro East Community Media. We'd also like to recognize any elected officials that are in the audience. If you're a school board member or a city council member, a water district member, would you please stand so that we can thank you as well for being an elected official. Lori, Kurt, David, thank you. Shirley is here, thank you. Appreciate your attendance. And last but not least, in my intros, I want to introduce the president of our cha chamber, Warner Allen of Warren Allen, LLP. Warner, thank you. <laughs> Matt Miller, who is the past president, came, where did Matt end up? There, hi Matt, thank you for coming. Matt Miller of Gresham Sanitary <laughs> Service. We need that sanitary service. Um, Andrew Morrison of Frontier Communications. Andrew, thank you for being here today. Applause, applause, applause. <laughs> Sue Piazza, bucket list travel tour. She's the president-elect. She's coming up to be our next president. And Jim Hathaway of Transamerica Financial. Jim is there with you. Thank you very much. Did I miss somebody? Did somebody come in? I don't think so. Thank you. Um, in a minute, I'm going to introduce Brian Lessler, um, who is the chair of the Government Affairs Council, but we've got two things we're going to take care of. First of all, we're going to flip a coin, the old-fashioned way, the ways to do things. Well, the way they used to do things was like that. Whoever survived got to go first. But we're going to flip a coin today, and this is how we're going to do it. Little humor, little humor. <laughs> Edit that out, Keith. Um, okay, so we've got Avakian and Richardson. One is... A and the other one is R. One is closer to H for heads and one is closer to T for tails. I'm trying to do this as fair as I can. I'm totally confused now. Okay, well, if it's heads, 
it's going to be Brad that starts because his name starts at the beginning of the alphabet like Heads does. If it's Tails that lands, then it's going to be Dennis. How fair can that be? Okay, so here we go. Let's see if I can do this. Yeah. What is it? Tails. Tails. Okay, Dennis is going to start, and then Dennis will start the closing. But I've got one more thing, right? Well, that coin, I've got to get back to Frontier. I, I, it took me two tables to find a coin. I can't believe that. Okay, if I did this. Olé. What am I calling? Exactly. We're going to have a little political discussion right now. Notice how. Okay. I can say that because I ran for Secretary of State as well. So, having said that, I want to introduce Brian Lessler with PDG Construction to introduce our two distinguished guests. Lynn, you do much better as a stand-up comic, um, so keep up that good work. Uh, thank you all for, for being here this morning, and I really am thankful for Brad and Dennis. Um, that uh, they were able to come here and share thoughts with us for this extremely important office. Uh, <clears throat> in my mind, perhaps um, at least the second most important elected office in the state. Some would argue maybe it's even more important than that. <clears throat> um, so which of you is going first now? Is that Dennis? Okay. <clears throat> so it is my pleasure uh, to introduce Dennis Richardson. There's a lot of things on the internet these days, and that's just where we get all this information. So um, I don't know them personally uh, well enough uh, uh, to be able to develop this. So <clears throat> if there's something in here that you want to disavow or disclaim, we'll blame it on the internet. So Dennis Richardson, as a combat helicopter pilot in Vietnam, Dennis learned that leadership sometimes means making incredibly difficult decisions in the worst possible circumstances. Dennis carried his military service and experience with him into his work and into his public life. The words Republican and trial lawyer don't always go together, but in his practice as a small town attorney, Dennis always put his clients first, working to ensure they had the best possible outcomes. His work as an attorney led him to a new path, public service. Dennis served on the Central Point City Council before being elected to the Oregon Legislature in 2002. Incidentally, it took Dennis about five hours to get up here from Central Point today. Uh, during his 12 years of legislative service, Dennis served in both leadership and policy positions. Uh, he was elected by unanimous vote as of, of his Democratic and public, Republican colleagues as Speaker Pro Temp in his second term and in 2000. 11, Dennis was selected as one of the co-chairs of the Joint Senate House Ways and Means Committee. As co-chair, <clears throat> Dennis successfully led the state out of a $3.5 billion budget deficit without raising taxes and ended that biennium with the largest ending fund balance in the state's history. Dennis has been married to his wife, Kathy, for 42 years. <clears throat> They've been busy. They have eight daughters, one son, and 32 grandchildren. That's two soccer teams. <laughs> when Dennis and Kathy aren't busy with family, <clears throat> and I suspect they're busy with family a lot, they volunteer in their community helping people find jobs, serving on the board of Access Food Share, or serving meals for, um, for the needy at a local shelter in Southern Oregon. Please give a, a warm welcome to Dennis Richardson. Thank you. Often when I'm introduced, they'll ask about family and I'll say, well, we have eight daughters and they all have a brother, <laughs> which causes people to stop. And then I remind them, well, it's all the same brother. <laughs> but this is a serious occasion for us to be here together. This is a serious election. I left the legislature after um, my last campaign and had retired. But the decision to come back into public service was a serious one for me to make. 
And it was primarily based on the fact that all of the things that I had hoped to accomplish as governor still needed to be accomplished. But as Secretary of State, we have the opportunity to restore accountability, transparency, and integrity to a high position state government. There are certain elections which are more important than others. And I believe that in 2016, the most important election is for Oregon Secretary of State. It's said that voters' decisions determine a state's destiny. The voters will decide between Brad Avakian and myself to be our next Secretary of State. And, and if you'll stop and think about this after you read about who we are and get to know what our backgrounds are and what we have to say today, you will have this decision to make. Brad Avakian will tell you that his work as a as the labor commissioner has helped prepare him to be Secretary of State. But he also is asking for the power to investigate private businesses doing business with the state and audit those private businesses. I'm different. I believe the Secretary of State's position ought to be one where we welcome businesses. As the head of the corporations division, I believe that we should be rolling out a red carpet to businesses, inviting them to come to Oregon to live by our rules and keep our laws, but help create jobs for our economy and for our job seekers. I believe that businesses in Oregon should not be looking over their shoulder constantly in fear of being investigated, but that there should be a, an office in the state where they can go and get help, not be fearful of huge fines to put them out of business but where they can go and say, you know, what do I do about this? And get guidance and get assistance. And the corporations division can do that. Maybe even more importantly is the office of chief auditor of the state. There are 72 auditors. And while Brad talks about using those auditors and that capacity and that part of the funding to go after private businesses, I believe that those auditors should be used as they were intended to be used, and that is to ensure that the people's money is well spent. What happened to the $305 million spent on Cover Oregon? There's been no audit, no lessons learned to ensure that we don't have those problems in the future. What about the $968 million spent on Betsy credits? Well, we're told that there's an audit taking place now. Well, it's years late. What happened to that money? Almost a billion dollars that could have been used for our, uh, our programs for education and for the poor and for the needy and for foster care. But instead, the money's just gone. Have we learned any lessons from it? No, because there's been no audit that's been completed. How about the bridge project? We all know we need a bridge. We know that there needs to be a lessening of traffic in the Portland metro area. But instead of an audit to determine how do you spend almost $200 million on planning for a bridge that never had a single shovel full of dirt ever be dug, how do you do that? Where did the money go? How, does, how did it get spent? And what can we do to ensure that when we take this project on again, that we don't spend hundreds of millions of dollars on planning and meeting, but that we actually get an agreement beforehand with the state of Washington and in conjunction with them build a bridge and help solve the traffic problem that we all suffer from. We have a clear decision to make. The voters' decisions will determine the destiny, at least for the next decade, of our state because of the various viewpoints we have on what is important with the Secretary of State's office. I believe it should not be prosecutorial, that we shouldn't be out searching for bad people. We've got we have agencies, we have the Department of Justice and Department of Revenue, even the, the commissioner's office himself, where they do investigations and they help ensure that wrongdoers play by the rules. The Secretary of State's office needs to track the money, ensure we have fair and open elections, that we welcome businesses. My 10, I've, I've organized 10 uh, delegations to China to help take Oregon products and Oregon companies to consumers in Asia so that they will send the money that they get from Walmart back here to Oregon. They want to buy American, and so we would go and say, 
don't just buy American, buy Oregon. I have the experience. I have the ability to work across the aisle. I know the limitations and the opportunities for fiscal and performance audits in the Secretary of State. I will restore accountability, transparency, and integrity to the Office of Secretary of State. But I need your vote to make that happen. I'm Dennis Richardson, and I'm here to serve. Thank you. I have to earn my free lunch here today. Yes, there is a free lunch. It's also my pleasure today to introduce to you Brad Avakian. Uh, as a civil rights attorney, legislator, and labor commission, Brad Avakian has fought to put progressive values into action and create economic opportunity for all Oregonians. As a legislator, Brad was named Consensus Builder of the Year for his work sponsoring the Oregon Renewable Energy Act of 2007 to create more clean energy jobs. A longtime supporter of equality for all Oregonians, Brad co-sponsored the Oregon Equity Act, which he now enforces as labor commissioner. The Oregon AFL-CIO named Brad as a working family champion and gave him a gold medal for his work building a stronger, more equitable economy for the state of Oregon. As Secretary of State, Avakian will use the Audits Division to investigate companies contracting with the state and require greater transparency for all corporations registering with the state to prevent and prosecute financial fraud. Raised in Washington County, Brad is a product of Oregon Public Schools. He graduated from Oregon State University in 1984 with a Bachelor of Science in Psychology and Lewis and Clark Law School in 1990 with a Juris Doctorate. Brad lives in Washington County with his wife and high school sweetheart, Debbie. They have two children, Nathan and Claire, who are both pursuing careers in the performing arts which might qualify them for a future in public life as well. <laughs> it's my pleasure to introduce Brad Avakian. Please give him a warm welcome. Well, I guarantee there will be no singing and dancing up here today. But thank you for that, Brian. And I, and I want to thank, uh, thank the Chamber very much uh, for, for sponsoring this event. This is actually the first uh, forum for the Secretary of State's race in this campaign season. I'm very glad that it's happening right here in Gresham. You know, I remember when I opened my law practice, um, hired staff, created a marketing plan, built a budget. It was an exciting thing to do. And for 15 years, I helped run or owned my own business here in Oregon. I know what it means to make a payroll every two weeks, to pay for benefits for your employees, to deal with the layers of state and local and federal business regulation. And I also know what it means to feel like you're out there all alone doing it with people and their families depending on you. As your labor commissioner for the last eight years, I have kept that in mind every time that a critical decision has crossed my desk. We reformed meal and rest period rules for greater flexibility for businesses that needed it. We changed the way that we process and investigate complaints so that we can get businesses out from underneath frivolous claims at the beginning. We're saving businesses millions of dollars a year because they don't have to fight meritless claims. We expanded our technical assistance for employers program that gets about 20,000 calls a year from businesses looking for free help navigating their way through complicated state and federal laws. And to help make sure that we can provide the best skilled locally trained workforce that you can find anywhere, we led the way on the restoration of 21st century shop classes to our middle schools and high schools. 343 schools in just the last three years. And during the question and answer time, if some of you are more interested in that piece, I'd love to tell you about a couple of, of the programs. As Secretary of State, I'm going to continue that effort 
The corporations division will be the place where a business can go in order to find the help that they need. If you're a business and you're dealing with uh, workers' comp issues, that's the Department of Consumer and Business Services. Maybe it's an employment tax issue, which would be the Department of Revenue. Or is it federal family leave or state family leave? That's the Bureau of Labor and Industries. But the corporations division will be the hub, the place where you can go in order to get the help getting the answer you need to be successful. The State Lands Board. We should look to the board to be innovative and effective in ways that it can use our lands and our waterways for great economic development and to support the Common School Fund here in Oregon. Many countries around the world are taking part in this booming clean energy economy, and Oregon should be a leader. Let's have the state partner with the private sector in order to use our state lands to promote clean energy jobs in our state. The next generation of Oregonians should be fully prepared to participate in our economy and in our democracy. And so just as we did with shop class, Let's bring civics education back to our schools as a required curriculum for every middle and high school student. And the audits division. The audits division will ensure that tax dollars are being used for their intended purpose. We're going to continue the same type of routine audits that Dennis talks about to make government more transparent and efficient. But it needs to be nimble enough so that when we see red flags going up in an agency, we can be there in an instant to audit and protect the taxpayer dollars. Now, some have said that I'll use the audits division to audit private contractors as well. And that's true. It doesn't mean that every business that contracts with the state is going to be audited. That's absurd and unfair. But what it means is that when we see the red flags going up, that we will be there in order to make sure that taxpayer dollars are being used as intended. That protects the taxpayers, but you know what else? It also protects other businesses that do play by the rules. Every business in Oregon ought to have a level playing field on which to compete for those government contracts. And you should not have to compete against a business that is skirting the laws or artificially decreasing its costs by not paying its workers or its subcontractors properly. The audits division will expose uh, that kind of a situation and provide for a more fair and just system. Now, in addition to these policies, let me add just one more thing. I know that some feel shut out of the process. We need to be a state that listens better, that opens its doors to both labor and to business. We need to be a state that builds the relationship with both equally. It doesn't mean that we're always going to be on the same page together, but it does mean that we will always listen to each other. Every tough decision that I've made I have made with you at the table. It's made me better at my job, and it's resulted in better policy for the people that work and that live in Oregon. I want to thank you again for uh, hosting this event, and I also just want to thank you uh, for everything that every one of you do to build our economy and our communities. Thank you. Okay, it's time for questions now, and I'd be happy to come around to you with the microphone, and I'll judge if they're good questions or not. No, I'm, I'm teasing. Someone want to start? Jeff, okay, here I come. Why don't you state your name and your business, and then the question. I don't want to state my business, then we'll know. Okay, state your name. I'll get audited. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Anderson, Focus Branding Group. Um, actually, this question, um, I guess could be for the both of you. You're both applying for the job of Secretary of State. Um, I've heard some things uh, from Mr. Avakian about pay equity and climate justice and, and uh, auditing of private companies. How does that fall under the purview of the job you're applying for? 
Well, everything that I'm talking about is something that falls squarely within the job. As a matter of fact, when I talk about making us a player in the booming clean energy economy, the Secretary of State's office through the Lands Board right now has got projects in geothermal technology, solar and wind in eastern and, and central Oregon. The lands are to be used to their best economic benefit to support the common school fund. Let's not always let that boil into a conversation about cutting old growth timber or cutting nothing. Let's look at what economy drives the best markets for us to take advantage of. When I talk about civics education, the Secretary of State sits on the state school board and has a direct role in the development of public policy. But I have to tell you, even if it didn't sit on that board, we need civics education back in our schools, and I think every elected official ought to take the lead in doing it. And then the last piece you mentioned that I just talked about with regard to auditing some private corporations that contract with the state, Dennis and I don't agree on this. I don't think that Dennis's method of looking at a state agency and tracking the dollars through their agency, and then at the very point it leaves the agency and goes into the private sector, we turn around and tell the taxpayers, oh, sorry, can't cross the line, whatever happens now, too bad. The Secretary of State has a duty to protect the taxpayers. And if that means making sure that corporations that contract with the state of Oregon and that profit off taxpayer money are also following the rules, then I'm going to make sure the taxpayers are protected there as well. I'll just comment and say that what is being described is taking the Secretary of State's job and expanding it to, uh, to accomplish what is being done in other agencies. What we need is a Secretary of State who will function in a non who will be welcoming to businesses, who will help solve problems, and not be looking to prosecute, to investigate, and to cause fear among businesses. There needs to be an agency where business can go and get help. And it's not enough just to say you're going to do it. Look at past actions in your current positions. Look at what people have done in the past. See how they handle their own affairs. And you'll learn a lot about how they will function in the position that they're requesting at this point. The Secretary of State's office should not be taking policy positions and trying to promote policy positions, but should be promoting a, a clean and efficient, effective and economical function of government. Another question? Jeff? <clears throat> I'm Jeff Kenway with Kenway Benefits Group. Um, question I have is, it, seems, it may seem a little off um, topic in some ways, but the most powerful position in the state is the Secretary of State next to the governor. And when we saw the uh, events of a year or so ago when uh, Governor Kitzhaber stepped down uh, among accusations of ethics violations, conflict of interest, that was just dropped. And I see posts by um, different people saying, oh, you know, uh, we didn't get accused, we didn't get prosecuted, so uh, we should be fine and go back into public service. To me, um, ethics is the most important part of government in, in, in business. And I don't see that in our government at this time. And I don't think anyone's above the law. And if you're going to not play by the rules, you're not going to do the ethics um, routine, uh, something needs to be done, and why wasn't it done? So I'll lead out on that. Had I not been running against uh, John Kitzhopper, he still would be in office. I filed a 12-page letter that laid out the accusations, the evidence of, cr of corruption that was taking place in that office and between uh, Sylvia Hayes and John Kitzhopper. There was sale of influence, and that is corruption. Now, there's been no prosecution, but we're told that the FBI is continuing its investigation. We can't get into the middle of that, but I firmly believe that no one is above the law, and that an elected official needs to set an example of integrity, of honesty, of paying their bills on time, of doing those things that need to be done to help show how a, 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 an honest and ethical person functions. And that didn't happen last time. John Kitzhopper's gone because he was unfit to continue as governor. 
Now, the fact that he hasn't been convicted of a crime doesn't change anything. Nobody forced him to resign. He resigned because the evidence was clear at that point that he should not continue as governor. And now that time goes by and people's memories are short, it seems like, well, see, maybe he wasn't so bad after all. The evidence is still there. I'd be happy to provide that 12-page letter which we sent to the federal prosecutor because we couldn't get the Secretary of State to audit the governor's office like he should have done. Well, let me answer in a little bit broader sense, too, because um, I was talking with folks before we got started today, and we know that there is a sentiment, not just in Oregon, but in this country, of wanting to elect people that we feel we can trust, that we have a relationship with, that are going to focus not on politics, but on the job at hand. And that's an incredibly important thing in this race. And I. Uh, you'll decide throughout the campaign, you know, who it is you believe, who it is you trust, who it is you want to put your faith in to, to be your Secretary of State. I would also add, pick the person that's got the record of accomplishment, the one who says when they're going to get something done, it gets done, that is not trust based on simply what we say we're going to do in the coming years in this office but what we've already shown we've done through a career of public service. It's important for us as, as voters and folks that are paying attention to politics to analyze people who are running for office in, in that way uh, as well. Hi, um, my name is Anna Snyder. I'm with Springdale Job Corps Center. Um, both of you are talking about business, one as, a, as Oregon being a, a welcoming state to business and the other as uh, developing an economy that welcomes uh, new energy businesses. And I'm wondering how those play into um, preparing the state's workforce and getting them ready to step into those roles or to be ready to step into the roles of new business? Just where does that, where do you play into that? Well, and, and this is one of the reasons that I mentioned you should look very carefully at candidates, not just to what they say they're gonna do, but what they've already done. Uh, Oregon has got to grow its economy and it's got to add jobs by helping businesses that are already here expand and by attracting new businesses to Oregon. And I travel the state regularly talking to hundreds of businesses a year. And what I hear is the top concern from businesses is where am I going to get my good locally trained workers that can produce the goods and services that help me succeed? And it was in the school cafeteria at the Prineville High School when they were talking to me about the loss of their Future Farmers of America program that we launched the idea of returning 21st century shop classes to our schools. Because the average wage of a worker in Oregon is getting up into the high 40s uh, and low 50s in some industry sectors. We know the average age of apprentices is 28 and a half and it's similar for first year community college students. We knew the return of career education was necessary not just to give a well-rounded education to students, but to provide the good locally trained workforce that businesses need, which is why when I talk about 343 new programs across Oregon's high schools and middle schools, I'm talking about wood shop and metal shop and welding, the things you think of as a shop class. But think of Beaverton that's doing biomedical engineering, Silverton that is doing pre-med and sports medicine, advanced computer-aided design in, uh, in Joseph, Oregon. This is the first step towards growing our economy and adding jobs in a way that helps businesses be successful. Um, I'm not going to take more time with the answer, so Dennis has a chance. But later, if somebody's more interested, I would love to tell you about the program of Clean Energy Technologies and Bend, which I think fits your question very well, too. Hearing this answer and about the focus on apprenticeships kind of reminds me of Al Gore and inventing the internet. Um, the apprentice program has been promoted by the legislature and by the trade union. They're the ones that are most focused on making sure that you have trained apprentices who have the ability to become journeymen. I was an apprentice carpenter when I first entered the workforce. I've worked with the unions. I've been a member of the unions. I understand how important apprenticeships are. But it's more than that. After I lost the last election, my wife and I volunteered for a year 
at a nonprofit employment office. I figured I couldn't provide statewide economic development, so I would do it one person at a time. And we helped probably 30 or 35 individuals get jobs or get training. And what we found was that they're demoralized because they don't know what to do, that they need an opportunity and a mentor. They need the training. I serve on the board of directors for Access Food Share in, in Jackson County. And as the community partner there, we deal with housing and food and education trying to ensure that people have the opportunity to bootstrap up, to be lifted out of poverty. We need educational training that reflects the needs of industry, that's responsive to small businesses and large businesses alike. That comes, from, we can make recommendations, but we're gonna have to work across the aisle, regardless of which of us is elected, and work with the legislature and help them to see the importance of utilizing the money that we save through proper auditing in a way that helps prepare people to come into the workforce and have family wage paying jobs. Thank you both for being here. Matt Wand, I'm with Yoshida. Um, right now, uh, businesses feel under siege, frankly, from the government, the, the state of Oregon in particular. And my question is about um, how can we count on you to be a protector of our interests, or at least fair. And I'd like to give you some examples, particularly Commissioner Avakian, from paid sick leave with the rules and regulations that are an utter mess, they're a disaster, to a higher minimum wage that is unsustainable and hurts younger people with no skills and prevents them from finding jobs, to the, the sweet cakes opinion where you issued a prior restraint on free speech that is very likely to be shot down and you planted your flag against businesses when all you had to do was say yes to what the administrative law judge had said because the ALJ disagreed with you as well. So with those few examples in mind, why would we believe that Secretary of State Avakian would stand up and be fair with us? I'm not sure who that question was directed to, but I'll give it a shot. <laughs> Let's take a few of those. You mentioned three in particular. I'm happy to talk about each of them. I, I must mention, too, the Sweet Cakes decision is at the Court of Appeals right now. But, but I will tell you this. When a case comes to me as Labor Commissioner, it's my job to weigh the facts, to apply the law, and come to a just result. That's exactly what I did in that case. The Court of Appeals will now have their chance to weigh in. With regard to the two other things, you're talking about policies that were passed by the state legislature, not me as labor commissioner. But to give you some examples of how I treated them as labor commissioner, when I just got the new minimum wage laws, I heard from folks in agriculture. I heard from so folks in businesses that had uh, trucking as part of their business or deliveries throughout the day. And I carved out an exception in the rules for deliveries that makes it a little bit easier for businesses to be able to track the minimum wage. At the same time, I know that the record keeping was very difficult and that some business sectors have got individuals that work in multiple uh, regions throughout a work period. So I again created an exception to take away the burden of record keeping for some businesses. Uh, so I took a law, brought in business, heard some of the concerns, and then passed administrative rules that I believed eased some of the burden that those businesses were feeling. Uh, without going through the entire law, the same thing with paid sick days. Uh, when I, right after I became labor commissioner, when I heard from the business community that it is so hard to figure out the meal and rest period rules. I pulled together a group of businesses and says, what do we need to do? And carved out another exception so that uh, businesses just like Lila Leathers um, and 7-Elevens uh, 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 and, and Plaid Pantries who have a business that is continually operating, sometimes with only one person working, and you can't lock the doors to take a meal and rest period, there's an exception for greater flexibility for businesses uh, to not have to follow the strict guidelines. The important piece of all of this is this. We're not always going to be on the same page, but having the kind of relationship where you can sit down together, talk about what the difficulty is, and find a way to ease that is the most important thing. And it's a relationship that I have always had with the business community in Oregon. Talk's cheap. 
The reality is different. Talk to businesses that have, that have their workers traveling in various pay zones and see whether or not they have a burdensome record keeping challenge facing them. You can implement laws in, and find ways to make it work for businesses or you can implement laws in a way that is punitive. You brought up sweet cakes. I think this is a perfect example where you have an administrative law judge who makes a recommendation, but you have someone who has power and goes to a mom and pop bakery that has made a mistake. And instead of saying, we want to counsel you about how in commerce you cannot discriminate, and even if maybe you give them a fine, a small fine, but for a first offense, to attach a fine of $135,000 to a small organization, you're crippling them. You're putting them out of business. There is a tendency, I believe, with some people that once they get power, as they suppose, they'll begin to use it in a way that is detrimental to those with whom or over whom they should be serving. Now, I don't know the motivation for that. All I know is the facts that are involved, and that bakery is no longer there. $135,000 for a first offense for not baking a cake, maybe they could have been counseled and helped to comply instead of shutting them down. Another question? Lynn, I know that oh, we I'm have sorry. another question, but I, I don't think that um, we need to be here and be casting aspersions on what people's motivations were. My job as your labor commissioner <laughs> is to serve like a judge, to apply the law that the legislature has passed to the facts that are at hand. Dennis is a lawyer. He knows I don't have the ability to find a business. He knows the process is different based on damages proven at a hearing, not based on a fine. Uh, he knows that there is no evidence that the actions of the Bureau shut down that business, nor was it ever the goal to. So I think it's important when we talk in public places like this, we tell the truth. We tell the truth and we look at the facts. That case in particular, there's an appeals process that will sort it out uh, later. That's the process we have here in Oregon. Um, but I'm hoping that this doesn't set a tone, Dennis, of a more personal nature between us in this campaign and that we can stick to the issues that are at hand. My turn for a question. Brian Lessler with PDG Construction Services. We're a commercial general contracting company. Uh, we presently have um, a decision uh, to make as a voting uh, group on Initiative Petition 28, uh, perhaps one of the most far-reaching initiative petitions uh, which has come down Oregon's uh, history in a long time. Um, I realize that both of you um, are just like us with respect to IP28. You're both going to vote your conscience and your thoughts. But your thoughts as public uh, figures uh, will influence a number of people. So I'm very curious, what are your thoughts regarding IP28 and how it will impact Oregon if it passes? That question's for both of you. You need to tell everybody what IP28 is. Not everybody knows. IP28 is a gross receipts tax. IP28 is an initiative petition that will pass a gross receipts tax on your gross sales of your business. Um, it's rather complicated. In fact, it's very complicated. Um, I won't go into the details of it. And probably many of you know them. Some of you don't. But um, in any event, I'd like to hear your comments on it. No, I'll go ahead. I can go twice in a row. That's all right. Uh, you know, we have done um, such tremendous work on the restoration of some school programs, in particular the one I've talked to you about with regard to bringing shop classes back to our middle schools and high schools. I don't know if you can point to anything that's happened in public education in the last two decades that has brought such an important and critical uh, set of curriculum back to over 150,000 students now, and it's just the beginning in where we're headed. If we do not have revenue reform in this state, those programs are gone. That is just the reality of it. They will be gone. I think it was the responsibility of the state legislature to take on tax reform, to pass a package, and I know a lot of you were at the table, with ideas on how to do it. 
that will adequately fund our public school system. It hasn't happened for decades, and it did not happen in the last two legislative sessions. We sit here today with only one plan on the table, with only one game being played, and that's Measure 97, IP 28. And for that reason, I support it. I do not support what's commonly known as IP 28. I do not believe that we need to burden businesses with more taxes while we continue to waste billions of dollars in unaccounted for money in programs that fail and that in audits that don't take place or recommendations that are made but not followed. We, I, I mentioned the, the almost a billion dollars in the Betsy tax credits it was wasted and the 300 million with Cover Oregon and 200 million with the bridge project, 76 million with modernization. There, the list goes on and on of waste and yet what you hear by a one party system that currently is in power is it's always about getting more money. Well, I don't believe we need more money until we quit wasting the money that we've got. We don't need higher taxes. We need more taxpayers with family wage paying jobs and businesses that are allowed to flourish so that jobs can be created and our economy can expand. So I'm not a supporter of IP28. We've had one of these on IP28, which is why some people applauded. Okay. Another question? We're okay. um, just about to the end of our time. Don't be shy. This could be your last chance before you vote. <laughs> Not really. OK. Oh, Sue's got a question. Can I make a really quick statement first? Mm -hmm. I think but, uh, I think, Mr. Barkin, should you not win, I think you probably would make a great Secretary of Schools for the state of Oregon. You seem to have a really good passion for education in everything you've said today. Um, but what I wanted to ask is, <clears throat> since I've been able to vote, which was 1980, um, I have heard constantly in the state of Oregon from when we started the lottery all about schools. And I've been on the Education Foundation out here for 20 years now. And all these taxes against businesses are so we can fund schooling. Yet here we are 20 years later in a worse situation than we've ever been. So my question is, not so much about funding the schools, but all these programs that have been brought to the state and all the taxes that continue to come in and be added on us citizens every year, what is being done in the Secretary of State's office to audit the money that's being spent by the state because this is not being taken care of. Precious little is being done. Can you remember, the, what's the last audit that you've heard about that the Secretary of State has done or recommendations on saving money? I bet you can't even think of a single one. I've already mentioned that the Secretary of State has failed to audit the three major expenditures that we've wasted over a billion dollars in the last few years. Why? Because it's about protecting party or protecting power, not about protecting the people. Now, education is crucial, but it's not just about raising more taxes with the idea that it's going to pay for education. I was co-chair of Ways and Means, and that means that I, with two Democrats, we were responsible for the state budget in 2011. I can tell you what happens is, if you get another funding source for education, they don't say, we'll give that to education on top of everything else. They say, okay, well, we can deduct that money that's coming in for education from this new tax and use this other money elsewhere. It just gets diverted. There's no guarantee that IP28 money will go to education. It's merely being sold as a pro-education package. But once it goes through, the legislature can do what they want with that money. Education is a crucial factor. We should be using the Secretary of State's power to audit those school districts that are not performing and find out why not just financial, but also performance audits. Why is it that Roosevelt has nearly 50% of their kids, closer to 50% graduating, while um, Lincoln has over 90% in the same school district, two high schools? That's wrong. And so why, what we can do is help, as through the Secretary of State's audit capacity, 
to help make recommendations of what's working. We have school districts in Oregon that are graduating 100% of their kids or close to it. They understand mentoring. They understand lots of things that we can utilize and we can make recommendations so that the policies being made by the governor's office and the legislature are not based solely or, or mostly on special interests and lobbyists that are presenting to them what they think should be done. Let's go back to evidence-based decisions. I appreciate you saying what you say. Public education is incredibly important. As a matter of fact, it's the thing that got me started in, in politics. When the Beaverton School District, which is, is the district I grew up in, my wife grew up in, my kids grew up in, eliminated its elementary music programs. And that was the time when Debbie and I looked at each other and said, we've got to get to the state legislature because that's the place where this can be changed. And I was very fortunate to have gotten a lot done in the legislature. But I didn't win on school funding. And we have disinvested in public education every session for the last 20 years. And we all have an idea of what works and what doesn't. These shop class programs that we've brought back, they're graduating students on time in four years at 91% compared to about 67% for the general graduation average around the state. We know that applied learning techniques are better than standardized testing. We know these things. When is the legislature going to fund them? Dennis wrote the school budget for years when he was in the state legislature, and it never happened. It never happened. And now, he and others are crying about lead in our water in Portland because it's a result of never having the budgets funded in the first place. I totally agree something has got to be done. The legislature has a role. The Secretary of State has a role through the audits division. You will see a strong audit for me of the public school system. That's not a gotcha to the system, but it's to root out, make transparent where we have problems, and provide the solutions to get there. The last thing I'll say is this. It doesn't have to always be about raising taxes. I think we need to take a strong look at the tax expenditure system in Oregon, the kind of deals we give to certain groups that keep money from coming into the state. I'm not saying they're all wrong or they're all right. I'm saying, for gosh sake, let's review them and see what's working and what is, isn't, weed out the ones we don't need and keep the ones that we do need. There's a lot of revenue there. That's another place where the Secretary of State can play a key role in auditing. This will go first on his rap. Five, two, two minutes. Two minutes. <laughs> you, you guys asked too many questions. So is it two, three? Two minute two, close. Two minute close. All right. Dennis, you're up. All right. I hope that this has been enlightening to you because you hear a lot of talk, but the real question is what will the performance be? And while one person takes all of this credit for shops and for apprentice and shop classes, that's not. It wasn't a one-man show. The legislature had to support that. The trade commissions, the trade unions, all were a part of that. But nevertheless, it is a good program, and I like the fact that we're bringing it up. But let's just not take credit for it. What is important is what will be the result of having Brad Avakian or Dennis Richardson as Secretary of State. He said that he would like to be investigating businesses. Maybe not all businesses, well, of course not. And prosecuting, going after, auditing businesses that do business with the state. I say, why don't we use our 72 auditors to find the money that we're wasting so that we won't be constantly be facing additional taxes and more problems for businesses and more burdens because reserve resources and that, those, that money can be utilized by the legislature and the governor to help education and help otherwise. I was co-chair of Ways and Means in 2011. That was the only time that education was funded first that I was in the legislature. All, usually education is reserved to the very end. You allocate the money over all these various budgets and then you say, we don't have enough money for education. Well, of course not because you've spent it on other budgets. We should, ed we should be funding education first and do those things which will help the greatest in need and in in, in achieve the goals of our state. Now, I promise to you, that as our next Secretary of State, I will restore accountability, transparency, and integrity to this office. 
we will focus within the constraints of the statutes and the Constitution. I'm not looking to expand this office to do more of what the, le the bully is currently doing. We don't need to step on other toes. What we need to do is ensure that the Secretary of State office is run in an honest, integral, and uh, with full accountability and transparency. That's my offer to you. Thank you. You know, something I've learned in my time in public service is that when the elections are done, it's time to turn the light switch off of the campaigns and turn your attention to simply doing the job. It's not about Republicans. It's not about Democrats. It's simply how public service should be. And Dennis talks about, you know, it's just all talk. It's just all talk. It's just all the rhetoric. Hey, you know, the, the party in power, you're doing everything to protect the party in power. It just isn't so. You know, when this federal administration came to Oregon a few years ago, abusively raiding blueberry farms here, illegitimately fining them over a quarter of a million dollars on phony wage and hour claims, I stood with the farmers and beat back the federal government. When this federal administration came to Oregon with new regulations to kick 16-year-olds off of our ranches and farms, I stood with businesses and rejected it. When Southern Oregon University shorted its workers $2.5 million, and when we had a, uh, um, a public official running the state training division for police that was abusing a worker, both agencies that report to a Democratic governor, I stepped in, investigated, and held them accountable. As Secretary of State, my job will be to ensure that every voice, regardless of political persuasion, is heard. Through the audits, government will be transparent and accountable for every taxpayer dollar. The secretary is a check and a balance on the rest of government. Its duty is only to the people of Oregon, and that's what you can expect from me as your next secretary of state. I want to thank you one more time for this uh, terrific uh, debate, and again, for everything that every one of you do with your businesses for this community and this economy. Thank you. So for a while, did you feel like mom and dad were kind of arguing about where they were going for dinner? or worse, um, that's what people do when they're trying to get their point across. A lot has changed since I ran for Secretary of State like 20, 100 years ago. At that point in time, what we were talking about was a vote by mail. And at that point in time, I was adamantly against it. I still am adamantly against it. I love the ritual of going to the polls. I do believe that you should be able to, by your own choice, get a ballot to your home. But I'm getting really tired of voting for my husband and just having him sign the ballot. <laughs> not really. I don't really do that. I don't really do that. But no, I do not do that. Drake, you can come on to tell people that. But things have changed. We didn't hear a single thing today about voting. Um, we have moved into a different era of what the Secretary of State's awareness should be. So I want to thank you very much. Before I thank you individually, I want to thank Riverview Community Bank again for being the presenting sponsor along with Portland General Electric, Gresham Barlow School District, and Metro East Community Media. I want to thank them as well. Um, you have a form on your table. We would appreciate if you would fill that out and let us know in honesty what you thought of today so that we can do better. I also want to thank Bob McDonald. It seems like we don't go a week without thanking Bob for something because he always steps up. Today he provided us with these two flags on the table. He brought them, he found them, he brought them, he placed them, and he's going to take them home with him. So Bob, thank you very much for doing that. It made it that much more patriotic today. We appreciate that. And shots, hear me roar, just for the women, Jeff, sorry. Um, July 27th, the reservations are going quickly, so please um, go online, take a look at how powerful she is, and sign up for that Women's Event of Breakfast event. And with that being said, the last but not least thing, I know all of you are registered to vote. 
but you probably know somebody that isn't. I provided one of these per table, and I have lots more available. Find somebody that doesn't know or hasn't voted or doesn't know if they're still registered to vote. Let's make sure as many Gresham people, Gresham area people, Gresham's businesses, East County vote as possible and be as in, informed as possible. Thank you for coming today, and thank you, gentlemen, both of you. Thank you.